just to be sure that you're in the right place, I'm Mark Laverton, and this is going to be a, a seminar on the dangerous act of worship, living God's call to justice. And um, if that's what you thought you came for, you're welcome to stay. And if you're actually thinking you're in some other seminar, feel free to get up and leave and go to whatever that other seminar might have been. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray as we begin. Oh God, how grateful we are that you hold all things together in Jesus Christ and that you are in and with and for us and the world in every way, that you have spoken in a way that's meant to change us and to refashion all that is as a mirror, a reflection of your reality and glory. So Lord, we pray that today as we uh, think about some important themes that are uh, on my heart and perhaps together on our heart, we believe that they are also even more, first and foremost, on your heart. So may we attend to that and live in response. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to tell you a little bit about my own story that explains uh, part of why this subject has come to matter so much to me, but I also want to have a chance to hear a little bit about why some of you may have come to this seminar. Um, I'm not fishing for anything here. I'm just purely curious of why you would come to this seminar. It will help to set a certain amount of context for what we're going to be doing. So maybe if just three or four of you would be willing to just uh, stand and just tell us why did you choose this seminar? What, it, what brought you to this particular time together? Three or four brave souls. Yes. Oh, okay. What prompted me about it is I have been watching on public television a program called uh, Justice, What is the Right Thing to Do? Okay. Mm -hmm. Put on by Harvard. It's a whole series of lectures. Right. Extraordinary set of lectures. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great lectures. And that when I saw this uh, seminar available here, I wanted to hear uh, what somebody from a Christian, very Christian perspective, uh -huh. you have to say about this idea of justice and how it relates to the idea of doing it in worship or how that will right. integrate. So okay, great, good, thank you. Yes? Hi. I came because I'm actually aware the work of justice uh -huh. in a very liberal kind of way every day, and I'm really interested in international criminal law and uh -huh. justice in that realm. So I right. Great, good, thank you very much. Yeah. Maybe one or two minutes? Yeah. Um, I came as a youth pastor uh, because uh, praise God that a lot more people are finding out about acts of injustice and trying mm -hmm. to do stuff to fix it. But pluralism today says that all justice is the same. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something I came to, to try to find out more about how I can infuse God into mm -hmm. the process. Okay, great. That's, that's a very interesting set of issues. Thank you. Yes? I came because I found that this radical worship for justice, whenever you do talk justice, you're really on the edge. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would see how you handle that very dangerous worship idea of actually worshiping for the sake of justice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can just be my prayer partner over here as this goes on. Um, I have a couple of friends who have read your book and they really appreciated it. Uh -huh. and I'm taking a class in my undergrad right now about Christianity and social justice. It's called Micah's Challenge. And, um, and I'm also, I don't know if you're going to get into this, but how corporate worship lends itself to mm -hmm. leading a congregation, the church, into um, mm -hmm. positive social action. Mm -hmm. Great. Great, great, great. That's fantastic. Yes. Um, I'm part of a church in um, a pretty unchurched area, and so one of the things we've been doing on fourth Sundays is actually having people meet to go out and serve. And some people love it, and some people think we're crazy, but it's brought life to a lot of people, and so I want to have them. Great. Well, my own story is that I grew up outside the church, um, and. Um, and I grew up with, uh, not only outside the church, but with very deep um, anti-Christian sentiment, um, bred largely by my father, um, in part through, um, uh, through some really negative experiences that he had as a kid that affected how he saw religious people. 
and religious ideas. And the, the main core of that would be for him probably this deep sense that, that what religion always did was make things small. I said a little bit uh, about this to some people the other day. The sense that it takes what is really great and glorious and makes it something less significant than it would seem to otherwise be. It's a small theological box or it's a small liturgical frame or it's a small set of ideas and it just takes this big, wondrous, amazing, staggering reality called the world and the cosmos and it makes it less than it actually is. Now, growing up in that sort of instinct, it, it was not a, just sort of a classic rejection of the existence of God. It wasn't a rejection of, of so much theological ideas as much as it was a theological frame that in its implications took you away from life. If my dad was about anything, it was about uh, an understanding of deep engagement with a real world that was complicated and needy and creative and full of passion and discovery and mystery. And all of that was just sort of full of my dad's spirit, but not uh, connected to any fundamental framework of meaning that would be outside himself. So as a consequence, that had its own limitations, but it also meant that I was bred in a context that meant be alive, and then on the other hand, don't do that if you want to, you will have no chance of doing that if you do that in the life of the church. I came to faith in Christ really through reading the New Testament. I didn't have any Christian friends. I didn't have, hang out in a Christian group. I didn't go to church. I didn't have any of those contexts. Through a series of circumstances, I started reading the New Testament for the first time. I, I just found myself being um, lost really in the Gospels, especially in the Gospels. And, and with this sense that Jesus had such deep identification with the doubt of my father toward religious people and toward this smallness that so much of what Jesus himself seemed to suggest about why the scribes and Pharisees were uh, problematical was that they took God's great revelation and made it something that was, again, so much smaller than it intended to be. And yet I could see that there was a human proclivity towards smallness. That's one of the ways I think of defining sin. And there's a human proclivity to simply management toward things that are just, we want to exercise control over. And again, that tends to bleed towards smallness. Um, but my faith was awakening, and I was beginning to know the God of the universe. And my mother's faith, which had been really latent for uh, decades in her life, began to awaken. She attended a church that was uh, not far from our home, and she met a pastor. She told the pastor that her son had had, quote, a religious experience. That pastor said he wanted to come and call on me, uh, something I was not particularly um, excited to hear. And uh, so on this particular day, an otherwise beautiful day, uh, he rolled up to call on me. And we we had a few moments of awkward conversation, and then after a few moments of conversation, he said, uh, well, really, I've come for three reasons. Uh, the first is that your mother's told me that you've had a religious experience. That might mean that you're going to be a pastor. <laughs> and thirdly, I just finished doing a doctor of ministry degree, which was a study of the, of the pension plans of all the major denominations, and I wanted to be sure that you knew which one had the best pension plan. <laughs> Now, silly me, I had thought I had begun to know the God of the universe, <laughs> that all reality was just beginning to truly open up in this vast, staggering, wondrous way. But the person that represented that gospel now in this moment to me really just said, no, it's actually about a pension plan. Now, if there was any one experience that defined everything that justified my father's convictions, it would be that moment, right? If there was a person walking in to demonstrate to my dad why this is worth avoiding, it was that moment, right? So the amazing thing was to realize that I want to believe that man had better days. I want to believe that he had a bigger gospel than that, really. But what I do know is that there is incredible shrinkage that tends to happen because of our own spirit, our own mind, our own profession, our own denomination, our own anxiety. We just want to get things in a manageable place and maybe what we can do is at least put our investment in the right pension plan, right? And when we do that, problematically, in the name of God, other people begin to think, well, then that must just be what God is about. And then we run into the crisis that Isaiah 58 is screaming about, and we will come to that text in, in a minute. If we were to ask the opening question, what is worship for? One way of defining worship, and of course, as you know, that there are many different ways of defining worship, I would want to suggest that the, the purpose of worship, the trajectory of worship, is to reflect God's glory. 
Now that word glory is a rich, rich, rich word and it means a, a number of things, but I would want to suggest for our purposes today that, that God's glory is really the, the reality of God. That worship that reflects the reality of God, that's the worship that God speaks. That we would mirror back to each other and to God the reality of who God is in God's truthfulness, in his grace, in his generosity, in his immensity, in his personality, right? That full worship, when the whole created order sings in the way that God has designed and intended it to sing, it will reflect, it will mirror the creativity of the God who actually made us. So the purpose of our worship then is, is not just to say to God the word glory, <laughs> it's to actually live lives that reflect the reality of God. I don't show any more of God by simply raising my hand or not, depending on our liturgical tradition, and saying to God the word glory. Glory. That's not showing God glory. That's just saying the word glory in God's presence. What I think the whole biblical text suggests is that we have been made with every part of who we are to actually reflect back to God the reality of who we've been intended to be, how we've been created, how we're meant to order our relationships with one another, how we're meant to steward our relationship with the earth, how we're meant to care for and respond to the, to the character uh, and grace and truthfulness of God. So the big worship call then, in that sense the big call to worship, is to actually reflect back to God in the fullness of the totality of my life, heart, mind, soul, and strength, and in the totality of my relationships with neighbors, friends, and enemies, the reality of who God is in the world. That's what a life of worship is meant to be about. And it also further extends into my attention, as we were thinking about yesterday, if you happen to be in worship, when we were thinking about what it means to pay attention in God's name to the world around us. And in particular, that psalm names a kind of stewardship of the earth, a domain, a dominion uh, over the animals and over the earth. This sense that it extends to every dimension of our life. And we as human beings have a unique capacity as those crowned a little lower than God to be able to do this work of worship and to orchestrate it as a, as a reflection of our own heart and mind, as a, as a pattern of relationship. So the Bible then and the giving of the law and the promises that God makes to Abraham and the demonstration of his deliverance of Egypt and all the things that unfold in the narrative of Israel and ultimately come about in the person of Jesus Christ are all meant to be God's response to enable the created order to actually reflect the reality of the God that we've been made for. That's the big call to worship. And often, tragically, worship has become this managed liturgical moment. This small habitation of what happens in a certain geographical space, in a certain architectural domain, in a certain liturgical act, all of which is a part of worship, not in any way making a counter argument to the legitimacy and importance of that, except if we make that the goal, let alone the summation. The worship that is going to tell the real story of our lives is not the worship that happens in a certain building or in a certain liturgical form. The worship that I think is actually the worship of our lives which we're meant to demonstrate, the worship that God measures most seriously, is not actually precisely whether we got the call to worship right. Not exactly whether the unity of theme from start to finish in a service is all that it could be. It actually is going to be whether or not our life, the sum of who we are, in relationship to God, in relationship to our neighbors, and especially perhaps in relationship to, the, to those at the margins and those who are our enemies, whether in fact we live there in a way that reflects the character of the God that we worship. Let me give you an example of what I mean. And I, it is a key text, it's a key text on this whole theme, and it, it will give us a way into reflecting on it, I think, a bit more. Probably you know it very well, Isaiah chapter 58. A text written at a time when Israel is probably already in exile. In any case, a, a text that is, uh, that's about the crisis of worship that, as God sees it in Israel's life. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. 
Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? The crisis that is laid out here in the first part of chapter 58, I think, is this crisis of what I want to think of for a moment is the crisis of as-if worship. As-if worship. Israel, if it believed it had anything right, it had worship right, right? They had the right God. They had the right law. They had the right temple, at least as long as they had a temple. They had the right sacrificial system. They had a right picture of how it was that they were supposed to observe the keeping of the law. They had the dietary practices. They had all the orchestration of the machinery of a life of worship. And all of that in some way was really clearly in view, it seems to me, when in this moment Isaiah speaks in God's name to the people of Israel and says, this is what God thinks of your worship. Oh, you are highly attentive. You are highly attentive to your worship, but you're actually avoiding the worship that matters most because what you're really absorbed with is as if worship. You worship as if you were those who practiced righteousness, a word that could just as easily in this text and in many other texts be translated as justice. You worship as if you actually were going to do something about this, as if your life was going to actually reflect the character of the God that you worship. But it actually turns out that you do the things that you do, and at the end of the day, do you know what it's actually been about? Isaiah says, it's really because you were absorbed with yourselves. You were taken up with your own interests. You were looking after your own welfare, and you weren't reflective of the character that's actually the character that, that is my character. And what's worse, you're doing all this in my name as if you actually represented me. When in fact, if your worship is as disconnected in how you live from what you do liturgically as it is, then in fact you violate me. This is why in Isaiah 1 and in many other places in Isaiah, you have this incredibly passionate language of God saying, I hate your worship. I hate your solemn assemblies. Now sometimes we get involved in debates about the idolatry that had also begun to infuse Israel. Okay, fair enough, but if so, then we need to actually consider our own idolatry at that stage and not use it as a way of excusing this to be a text about their idolatry, because if that's the case, we've got plenty of accounting to do in our own terms about our own popular idols. But here, the way that it's what's described is, but what's been disconnected is that you have a whole set of liturgical practices which are unhinged from your moral, ethical, public life. And that exposes the injustice in you, which then shows the inadequacy, the barrenness of your worship. It is as if worship. They, were, they ask of me righteous judgments. It's a word spoken here in, in a kind of bitter irony. You ask of me righteous judgments, the very thing that God is going to be doing in this very text. Oh, I will give you righteous judgments, but you ask of righteous judgments that are going to serve your interests. You're asking me to answer your prayers because your greatest vision is for your welfare. All of this is part of the bankruptcy, the profound bankruptcy and the permeating crisis that this causes in Israel's life. So why do they fast? Just to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. The sense that you may fast, but, but the consequences of that shows up in the way that you fight over your fasting, <laughs> over the way that this actually shows that you don't pay attention, again, in Psalm 8 language, you don't adequately pay attention to someone made in God's image for God's purposes. You just get lost in quarreling and fighting and trying to win. It's just a battle of power. Justice questions are always, in some way or another, around issues of power. 
You, such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? All common expressions of this sense of just acknowledging in our physicality that we are willing to, to do obeisance before God in the sanctuary of God with the people of God and all the while violating God by actually a, a barrenness of spirit that doesn't demonstrate in real relationships of responsibility, authority, in relationship to those that may serve us, in relationship to the people that are the greatest in need. The, the people that God sees are actually in our sights, and that we see them not just for our own self-interest, but we see them in relationship to a God who says, these are the people, this is the world that I have called you to reflect to as an act of worship that it is me that's actually the center of your life and not you. And if that exchange is going to occur, it will mean then that your heart and your mind and your relationships have to literally be turned inside out in order for it to become possible for you to see people the way that I actually see them and to attend to them in the way that I call you to attend to them. It's that that I think then brings the transition from the first part of chapter 58 to the second part. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? It's so stunning. He says nothing about improving their liturgy. He says nothing about get the call to worship right. It's, it's nothing about refining your musicality, all of which has its appropriate place in worship, all of which is part of a full offering of our life, none of which is fundamentally the, the critique. It's not about get your liturgy right. It's get your life right as a reflection of the reality of the fact that you want to live a life of worship. And if you fail to make that transition, then in fact, the benchmark by which I, God, measure worship is actually being lost in the, the sea of the things that you are attending to. Here's what I'm going to look for, God says. Do you show up among the oppressed? Do you show up with justice and compassion? Do you show up with a lack of self-interest, with a capacity to enter into someone else's reality, to actually be an agent of, of justice and mercy and kindness to the widow and the orphan and the blind and the marginalized and the forgotten. Do you, do you show up there? Well, now that begins to be an, an enacted life of worship that starts looking like my character. Not as a project, but as a reflection of my character, God says. I think it's extremely important that when we think about this dangerous act of worship, the danger that I want to talk about is this danger that God actually does measure our worship. You know, the, the anecdotal evidence that there is everywhere that after every service of worship, there's a kind of quick little chart among the people that have attended the service about, so how did it go for you? How was the sermon? Tick. How was the music? Tick. How was the liturgist? Tick. Right? All these, whatever the things were that, that are the benchmarks that we might bring. Well, God says, oh, I have a list like that too. I have my after-service worship measuring chart. I go to brunch too with the Trinity, and we sit around and we talk about, so how was the church's worship today around the globe? And it doesn't turn out that it's about the sermon or the liturgy or the music. It's about, well, where are the people of God showing up in the places that show my character? And if, in fact, the church doesn't show up there, then what was this? What, what was that thing that they did that they call worship? That's not the thing that I'm actually committed to, not as an end or as a destination. Can it be a means? Can it be a, an enabling thing? Can it have a reality and integrity all of its own? Absolutely, it must. Is it therefore worth giving thought and care to how we do that well? Absolutely. Should it be done for God's glory? Right, it should but so that it propels a life of worship that shows up in peculiar, unexpected places where God's people go where other people don't, where God's people attend to what other people do not attend, where God's people engage and love and serve and care in a way that reflects the God that we worship. And in that, we show God's glory. That's a brief little synopsis of my understanding of what I think the Bible means about a life of worship. So the danger is, oh, our worship's going to be measured, but it may or may not be measured by criteria that we are using. And if we look at the danger by which it's going to be actually measured, then it turns out it will be whether our life has actually become a mirror of God. 
and a mirror of God as measured in relationship to difficulty and struggle and pain and need and self-sacrifice. So on those grounds, it's dangerous to ask God to take our worship seriously if in fact our worship doesn't land in any of those places. Or if we make it just a little project, a little kind of side event, a little natural consequence, instead of something that actually is organically tied to enacting, living in the life of God. It's that that's really the key. So one final thing, and then I want to get some questions. The core of this is that we're not taking on concerns about justice now as an add-on to worship, like a little sort of extension, a, a little special offering on the side for those that are especially motivated, right? This is not a project for those who, who happen to be, quote, social justice-minded. That's not what's being discussed here. This is about, are you going to be a people that reflect my character, and I am a just God who cares about the abuse of power, who attends to a people that are now going to be redefined in their life by my power, and who then wants to be called or are being called into a life that demonstrates what life emptying power means. And ultimately, of course, the cross becomes the very core of this. So that Philippians 2 is the enactment of God's demonstration of an inverted world of power in which worship then reorders all forms of power. It reassembles reality every time we gather together and it enables us then to go out and live in the context of the world in which we are a part, where there's so much need and concern. We live in a reordered world where power has been clarified in light of what really matters and what really doesn't. And it's no longer then meant to be an agenda set by a culture that's self-interested, narcissistic, and self-absorbed, but centered instead by a God who intends an entirely different way. That power is to enable human flourishing, where every person crowned a little lower than God is meant to be seen and known and loved and drawn by that into an experience of the reality of their full humanity. To do what? To give God glory. So let me pause there. I want to go on and say some things about um, worship practices in a way, but just let me see if, uh, I don't know how much of any of this is really familiar terrain to you. You want to throw tomatoes? I mean, whatever is fine, so. I have a question. Um, one of the campus ministers at the, at the college I studied at said that we sing our theology. Mm -hmm. Is I believe true, and I mean whether or not I should have done this. I go to some worship services and I make judgment calls on whether it's kind of honest worship or not. Uh -huh. And though the language is similar, it's not exactly the same. So I have to believe that um, the the words and the the litur liturgical practices that we use are actually really important. really important. Absolutely. And um, and so even though ancient Israel may have had this right liturgical practices, they can't have been exactly like they might have been using this right language, the right um, actions, but but they they would look different, I believe, if it was actually flowing into their life, which makes the way the liturgy and the words that we use and the language we use unbelievably important. Right, but uh, let me. I, I, the direction of the inference of your question is the part I'm trying to get at. So the inference that you're drawing from that observation, which I think is true, is 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 what exactly? Well, what am I trying to ask? Yeah. Is, um, it, is it that the inference of that observation would be we should work harder at our language? Well, it's just you were saying that um, God in the second half of Isaiah 58 didn't make any judgment calls on the liturgy. It was, it was all of the... Um, the ethical life and public right. life of, the, of right. Israel. But um, I'm, just, I'm just... You probably agree with this, but I'm just trying to say that this actually, it's actually still really important even if it's not... Right. It is still really important. And, and therefore, it makes it all the more shocking that, in fact, it's not in the second half of Isaiah 58. And I say that not to discredit its importance, but to acknowledge its, its insufficiency as an end in itself, right? So, so if we actually were to say, well, then the, the resolution to this needs to be that Israel just needs to, it would get there, it, that is, it would get to the point of being a people committed to loosing the bonds of injustice if we had better liturgical language, I think that's not true. And the reason I would say it's not true is the incarnation. We are not actually saved by words. We're saved by the word. A living reality of being 
in the world, which involves language, and, that, and in that sense it involves liturgy, it involves religious forms, it involves religious practices and rhythms of life of all different kinds, but we are saved actually by a living word who is the incarnation of this. And I do not think it's pushing too hard on this language to suggest what the second half of Isaiah 58 is suggesting is that we, the people of God, are meant to be a living incarnation of God. That is our worship. Now, as we seek to do that, will we find it really helpful, maybe even at times we would almost say essential, to find better liturgical language tools and, and implements to mature in that way, yes. But this is where I, I think I live in, in a certain amount of, of uh, admitted tension between a suggestion that says, if we just had better liturgy, and this is maybe not what you're suggesting, but there are plenty of voices who would say this, if we just had better public worship, we would have better public life. Well, on one level, I'm quite happy to acknowledge that. Sure, it, would that help? Absolutely, it would help. But what I think is being called for isn't even that as a passageway. It's just like, get out and actually start living the life that you've now had multiple decades of refining at any given moment out of your liturgical practices and start showing up in the places in the world where actually the evidences of God's presence is going to be outside the bounds of the liturgical frame. So I just, I want to acknowledge the importance of what you're saying, and I also believe that this text pushes us to actually not retreat into liturgy as sometimes the people of Israel and the church is prone to do, we just need to get the liturgy better, which is really, I think, not what Isaiah is saying, nor, more, more significantly, is it what the incarnation is saying. Good liturgy wouldn't allow you to retreat into it. It would push you out. Touche. I would, I, okay, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the ways I would communicate that regularly was to stand at the, at the, uh, I mean, it was permeating our services, but one of the ways it would come out would be at the end of the service of worship, and I would say, now we come to the most important part of the service. Will we or won't we live our worship? As we leave here, and as we anticipate coming back next week, what we're going to be doing is actually living a week of worship. What we've done today, we hope, is a piece of enabling you to do that. And this service will be judged not by whether you liked the sermon or didn't, whether you liked the music or didn't, but whether or not you enact its life. Now go and live your worship and pronounce the benediction. And I think, in a way, it's a way, one of many, many ways, of trying to just simply reinforce the most important th forms of worship are beyond the liturgy. Right. That is our work. We work together. The liturgy extends beyond the doors of the church. Right. It's all that we do. Right. So I think as, as pastors, or as worship leaders, or whatever, yeah. an opportunity to communicate with the congregation, a different way of looking at worship. Um, yes. Maybe to your congregational meeting, you can say, this is how the life of worship of this church it extends from all the way over here to all the way over here. Right. It has a fuller vision beyond just music or beyond just Sunday morning. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Yes? One thing I think uh, worship is able to do is to accomplish the kind of vision that you spoke about in Psalm 8. Mm -hmm. Right. Or that you talked about here uh, in terms of seeing people that otherwise would be neglected. Because you can see it in Jesus preaching himself when he's asked about eternal life. Right. He tells the story about the Samaritan Right. Or someone that otherwise he would have neglected. That's right, that's right. I'm curious about whether you've done any meditating on the relationship between uh, compassion and justice and the gift that perhaps worship can prove to be as a catalyst. Well, I think worship holds the whole character of God, which involves justice and compassion, among other things, right? So one of the gifts of worship is that it allows, it's multi-textural, multi-denominational, and multi, um, multi-referential, right? So you're, you're working on many dimensions of, of the one that we name as God in Jesus Christ, who, who's clearly not a small project to try to name or, uh, or to label, right? So I think the richness of what worship creates is an opportunity as a community and as a 
pastor to be able to lead people into different dimensions of uh, engagement, reflection, consideration with who God is. And, and, and hopefully in that process, to grow greater and greater souls, hearts, minds, strength, to be able to actually then reflect that as we leave, leave this space. So I think that the, the definitions between compassion and justice <coughs> probably have to do, at least in my reflections, it's tended to have more to do with, a, with, a, with an empathetic identification with a person in need, um, which is also, which is always mutual and never just unilateral. So compassion is a relationship. It's not just a, it's not just a, uh, a commodity that I have to, that I as a person of privilege have to give to somebody who's in need. Even when I'm with a person in great need, I am also the recipient of their compassion in this exchange or their potential compassion in this exchange. So, and, and that's also a reflection of the reordering of power. So I would say that is a piece of compassion, but it's also a piece of, of justice, which is a, a word that I think, as probably all of you know, is a word that does slide between um, the right ordering of power, uh, which could be, um, it, it, which it needs to be true in every dimension of life and in every relationship. It's not just about political power, it's really about power in every dimension. Power ultimately that's defined by the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who is Lord overall, right? So, um, so in any act of justice, there's also that, but I think the difference between compassion and justice in that sense is that in, when you're confronting issues of justice and injustice, you are probably more nakedly discussing or engaging that work of power redefinition or healing than you are in works of compassion, in which it may be the consequences that you're actually working with more than the actual um, origins of the of the problem. Does that m make sense? Yeah. Yes. Um, what are some of the most effective ways that you have seen to move a, a congregation into the life of sacrificial love that we see in Isaiah 58 uh, with justice? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, that, first of all, you have to take on the big project of, of helping, um, of realizing that as a pastor, I was a pastoral le theological leader, that you're engaged in a long work and that that work is still going on in you and it's needing to go on in your congregation in different ways and that there will be, uh, it's a long process. So there's no flashpoint, there's no bumper sticker, there's no um, you know, f fast way of accomplishing this. It's not done by a video project or a short term mission trip or anything like that. I'm, I'm talking about a long term project of transformation and a long term project of transformation among a really diverse group of people who have all kinds of history and issues in their life. So I do think uh, clearly that one of the key pieces of this is just uh, biblical, right? I, I think that a, a lot of the anemia of the church is biblical um, ignorance. So, so part of it is that. But clearly, we're not saved by biblical knowledge any more than we're saved by liturgy. So it's not just knowledge of the Bible that's going to produce a willingness to live a sacrificial life. It's actually enabling people to take steps of worship that actually lead them into some sense that they, that enables them to actually acknowledge their own neediness and or to respond uh, to the circumstances of people around them in a way that's going to call them beyond themselves. Now that has to happen developmentally, right? So you figure out a different, with different groups of people and different ages of people, different ways in which this process is actually um, something that's going to unfold. I think my own strategy as a pastor was to realize uh, that Jesus was onto something with the three and the 12, and that, uh, that part of that process is going to happen probably most seminally in some small group of people that I'm going to be particularly uh, engaged with myself, who over time in conversation and life, shared life together, that we're going to take a journey that's going to take us into places that are um, difficult for us, and to feel that, that we're capable uh, in Christ of going to those places with our own fears and anxieties and that God is really a God uh, who has the capacity to lead us into deeper places. And I, I think you can do that in, you know, sort of concentric circles of people, but acknowledging that in many ways um, it is going to be a slow and personal process because a lot of what this is about has to do, for example, with dealing with people's issues of fear. Right? Why does Israel hide? Why does it hide in its liturgy? Because it's just easier. I mean, liturgy is just like way safer to manage than anything to do with engaging in the raw reality of the abuse of power in the world where people are, for example, the victims of violent oppression. 
That's just a totally different thing. Whatever we think the worst moments of the worship wars were, they weren't that. They weren't being sold into a brothel. They weren't actually confronting an oppressor who holds you in bonded slavery. They weren't systems of injustice that leave you namelessly lost in a sea of extraordinary need with no capacity, no leverage point, no, no place to stand, right? If you're going to engage that, you're going to come in contact with your own fears at a level that is probably a lot more than most of us, thankfully, would otherwise do. Why do we do that? For the same reason that we're exhorted in Philippians 2 to Jesus Christ, who though in the likeness of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. So how, how do we practice self-emptying? So I think with leaders in a church, um, it, in new members classes, in um, whatever your process of, of, um, of that may be in your congregation, um, to in some way fairly regularly be talking about the fact that, that really being part of the, of the company of God's people is to enter into community of suffering, to a community of identification with people who suffer, to be people who carry burdens. That's one of, that's one of, our, uh, one of our vocations. We do it out, not out of a kind of uh, legalized um, duty-bound oppression, but out of a sense that this is actually what causes life to flourish, that we seek f human flourishing made in the image of God, and therefore, of course, we would come alongside those, and of course, that means that my flourishing, which is manageable when I live in my own privileged world, is going to be undone by the disruptive influence of people whose lives have very little of the privilege that I have. Um, there was a time not long ago where, where I uh, had this silly thing happen where I left my computer on an airplane. Now, in this moment, uh, you know, the, the, the personal crisis was I just need the computer and I need all the information in the computer. Okay, that's its own crisis. But the much more interesting crisis to me, even in that moment, was, isn't this interesting? I am so seldom in a place where I have no power to get something that I'm entitled to. Well, now that's worth sitting with. I am so seldom in a place where I am without power to get what I'm entitled to. It's my computer. I'm entitled to have it back. It was an innocent mistake. It's now in a system. In that case, Southwest Airlines. It's just in a system. And you call and you get the machines. And then you get the clerks. And they don't ever tell you the same things. And eventually, astonishingly, astonishingly, I want to hustle to say, Nine days later, I got my computer back. But in that season, I did every day try to make time to just reflect on being in a small way more powerless than I usually am. Now that is really worth identifying with. <laughs> Where are the, and then those moments of realizing, I have so far to go. I, I have, am handed life in so many ways as a tall, white, educated male in North America with education, with a healthy family, with a healthy body. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on and on of my privilege. And I don't share that with about two-thirds of the world, at least, if not more. So how do I enter into that point of concern? Uh, an example that uh, I'd like to bring up in through uh, church, our church we have a food pantry. Uh -huh. Okay, and it's developed. It's a God thing, we think. But we serve these people uh, food every week, and so that's our our uh, compassion. Yes. But then you get in a situation. There's a registration for this. Mm -hmm. Families are allowed to get one basket of food or two, is what we hand out each month. But people find ways around that. Mm -hmm. okay? So now you get into this justice part. Okay, do you point out or try to eliminate the injustice going on right. if somebody is taking more food than they're entitled to? Right. And then you have people who work in the pantry who are from a recovery community. Right. And, ah, they see an extra loaf of bread. Right. Do you teach them that that's not proper because we as the volunteers, we don't take an extra loaf of bread. Right, right, right. Well, and it puts us right into that, that 
vortex, which is both a function of real justice and a function of sociology, right? So some of what you've just said is really what I would call justice, and some of it is a sociology of practice that's kind of a cultural definition of fairness, right? And, and so part of it has to do with how do we negotiate that? So if you live in some communities, uh, fairness isn't at all defined as you've just defined it. I identify with your subculture, so I totally understand what you're describing, but I'm also aware that I'm in other communities of people because of their ethnicity, their context, their social setting, where in fact some of those premises would really be quite debatable, quite debatable. So, and it would be debatable even by Christian people who would say, I'm not sure that that's an issue of justice. Now, the point there isn't to get lost in a, a, a theological or even a philosophical debate about the nature of justice, as much as it is to acknowledge, what does that unmask? It unmasks all kinds of issues of power, right, that have to do with who gets to define the rules, who gets to define how many meals is right, who gets to define and control, who gets it, who measures whether people have taken it or not, right, et cetera. It's really, it, it, yeah, it becomes a, v absolutely, absolutely they do. And this is what causes burnout, right? Because often what causes burnout when churches decide that they're going to become minded in this way, then they sort of give themselves to a certain project mentality. Then the project mentality either gets wearing or it turns in some way that feels sort of distasteful or awkward or whatever, or you get up with an argument with the other volunteer at the place where you're volunteering because you have colliding visions of what you're doing and now you're having a hassle with each other and you just, just one person just decides, I just can't go there and they say that it's really because they need to do something else with that time but really it's because they are trying to avoid the conflict with the person that they're volunteering with, right? Now, what I think is so interesting is that all that is the stuff of worship. So what all that stuff is about is actually coming back again and again and again to saying, so now, so now how does the God of Isaiah 58 actually look upon those, all those moments? And how do we as theological or pastoral leaders in our congregations help people to step into all those places? So how do you gather the leaders that are having this and reconsider how do we want this to be? So I think of friends of mine that are involved in a food pantry in San Francisco who have a, a very uh, extensive food pantry that involved, they feed about 800 families a week. They began to get into this tangle and they did so for probably five years and then they realized, you know what, we can't actually undo this by a system. That's the problem of the law always. We can't actually finally resolve this with a system. What we're going to do is trumpet with generosity. So we're going to back off and have, in that sense, no rules. And we're going to be absolutely vulnerable to its possible abuse. And then we're going to see what happens. Now, they did it as an experiment. They started with just saying we're going to do this for six months. That extended to a year. That's now extended to many years. And now there has been an equilibrium that has been established in which they now have a sense that they're completely police free in that sense. There's no sense that they're trying to boundary this. Is it abuse? They go, yeah, it is sometimes abuse. And we're, we're really capable of absorbing that abuse because that's the magnanimity with which we're choosing to live. We're just going to we're just going to trump it. We're not going to try to police it. My point would be, would be a, Chris, a uh, reflection of your worship if you were to begin to uh, teach the idea to the people who were receiving the food that what they were doing is incorrect. Yes. Yes, I think, that's, I think that's worthy, absolutely worthy, and faithful to our worship to do that, provided that it's not a condition. So, so then it becomes, so then how do you teach that without making a condition? So in this food pantry, if you were to be there, you would see it's a Christian food pantry. In this food pantry, there would be a very strong sense of responsibility that in fact we, we attend to each other, that, that everyone gets to come to this table, that that means that we have to observe. So there's a definite negotiation of relationships, of deference, of acknowledging and inviting other people into this generosity. But then they're inviting people into this generosity where they pay attention to their neighbor in that way, rather than the, I'll call it this, not to be harsh uh, toward your practice, but to just right. give it an edge to say, rather than, to police their neighbor. Like, let's, let's actually realize that even as people that are receiving food, that we can actually extend generosity to the people that are around us. Let's, let's have a place where the food pantry spills over into learning a lifestyle of generosity, where people that are desperately hungry can also themselves, in turn, offer food to the people that are around them, rather than hoard it. Now, will we, because we're human beings, run into that collision? Oh, yeah, that's, 
That's a guaranteed uh, thing. Let me just um, go on to a couple of other things that I want to say. I think all this has to be really worked into not just our um, uh, into our preaching, but I think it has to be worked into our liturgy. So I think there are things in the practices of worship, in the ways that we name things, the, the kinds of songs that we sing, that we simply work at enlarging our vision of others in the world. Many of you, I'm sure, would be aware of the co common critique about uh, so many contemporary worship songs that are really eye-oriented. I think that is a huge crisis. I think that's one of those places where our, our theology is only as good as our grammar. And when our grammar is really so individually personal uh, and individualized in a way that reflects disconnection from the community, then we're already sort of going down a road that may have its place from time to time, but only from time to time. So for example, the whole plural, pluralism of language and musical language that ends up talking about who are we and how do we offer our, ourselves to God. But then how do you take people in, their, in, the, in the prayers that are offered and keep moving them toward a God of self-sacrificing love? So I often think that the, the boundaries of that, sometimes the elasticity of that, is that it's enough sometimes to, to help people think that we're called to love one another. So we're sitting in a set of pews, the random church, we're called to love one another. Sometimes just loving one another in the life of the church is a really huge thing. I mean, there were certainly people in my church in Berkeley who I know went to one service as opposed to another service because if they went to the other service, they would have to run into so-and-so and they really didn't want to do that. So their worship practice had become, I'll just avoid them by going to another service. Now I used to reflect that back to the church every once in a while and say, isn't it interesting that we sort of define where we're gonna go on liturgical language, musical preferences, generation, but also hostility. Like, some of you are in this service because this other service is. Now, let's just think pastorally about how do we attend to that? How do we try to acknowledge that? How do we let our worship right in this room begin to be more a reflection of that? I think of a time when I was serving communion on a high stone chancel, and I was handing the trays across the table to the elders that were coming up to receive them, and two of the elders collided, and four trays of, of growth juice and bread went splattering all over the floor, and because it's a high stone altar, it made an unbelievable clanging sound, and then endured as it rolled and spun <laughs> down the steps. I mean, it was really a liturgical mess, right? It was, it was, a, cr it was a crisis of the moment. But the most telling and profound part of that whole experience was the look that went between one elder who collided with the other elder. Now that was, a, in my language, a crisis of worship. They were so caught in the sense of shame, embarrassment, hatred, that one had clearly collided with the other. That now the table is violated not because the elements have fallen on the ground, but because of this bitterness between these two men. So after that service, I said, you know, I'd really love to meet with you in my office or wherever you want to meet for a few minutes, because I think there's probably some things we should talk about. <laughs> and, um, and it was the beginning of a series of conversations that unfolded into layers of previous things that I knew nothing about between these two guys that had to do with, in that case, decades of hostility that they had already experienced, and all of which they brought to that communion table, where in this collision, it became like the emblematic moment <laughs> where it was all, okay, so I just want to acknowledge there's a lot about that work that can absorb our attention. So by all means, let's give ourselves to that work. But as we give ourselves to that work, then there's the, the elements of also saying, but how do we also liturgically and otherwise lead people beyond the places where we are today to think about the people that are in our neighborhood, the people that are in our town, the people that are in our region, the people that are around the world. And that's where, um, where the, the steps that we can take in the context of our own liturgical worship to actually bring those pieces into visceral, tangible focus is to me a, an extremely important part of it because at the end, when I give that benediction and send people out into the world, I want all that to be really palpable. Now, if it's gonna be palpable for the people, it needs to be palpable for me. So I have three people that I receive emails from overnight on a, on a Saturday night that live in three different parts of the world who live in desperate conditions with the desperately poor. The only emails that I ever read before worship are those three emails, which I always read every Sunday morning before I preached, so that I would go into worship living in part in those places. Because whatever we're doing here, if it only works if you're 
my type of person in my culture, my social location, my race, my denominational context, if it only works if you can manage it all in this way, and doesn't, if what we do here doesn't actually matter in all these other places around the world, then in fact, what we're doing here, I would venture to say, is guilty of the condemnation of Isaiah 58. So I want to personally take into worship, not spokenly, just in my own spirit and attitude and awareness, who is this God? Why does this matter? To whom and to what does God pay attention? What are we going to be doing here and how is that going to enable that sort of attentiveness to be cultivated in our church? And then how over time do you develop in relationships and liturgical forms ways of remembering, seeing, engaging? Then how do you take your life out there, as it were, and bring it back into the liturgical context so that it's not just about church life, but about how church life enables public life? That's the inside-out church. That's the church that's about what we're doing here is for the sake of what we're doing out there. If we think this is a destination and an end, then I think we've already got the equation wrong. If, in fact, it's a means to a much greater end, which is really the church in the world living the reality of God and showing the glory of God in every vocation, every dimension of culture, and especially in relationship to all of those people and places where, where power and power abuse is the most rife, then it begins to be a church that mirrors what I'm calling and understand to be the glory of God. So it comes down to really tangible acts. It, it comes down to trying to get out of a project mentality. It's about how do I begin to, to practice uh, and write liturgies that are going to enable us to lay down power? How do we write daily liturgies that can encourage in our, uh, in our congregation? How do I take the privilege that's been given to me and offer it to God to lay it down rather than to hold it tight? How do I find the places where I'm least prone to do that and where I'm the most prone to do that? How do I practice daily taking up, in that sense, the cross that I've been called, not as a consequence of accident, but as a, as a calling, as a vocation, as a willingness to, um, to actually lay hold of the thing that, that is going to enable me to share in the, in the just and compassionate and merciful heart of God. Those are the things that I'm wanting. Those are the things that I think our congregations are in need of. And if the church actually demonstrated that, you wouldn't have the consequence of, of a study like uh, Ron Sider's study of the scandal of the evangelical conscience that when study after study is done that there's almost no reflection of a, a social distinction in the public life of those that are inside the church compared to those that are outside the church. That is an indictment, an indictment of preaching, an indictment of worship, an indictment of our theology, an indictment of our liturgy, an indictment of unbelievable vast resources committed to a better vision, all done in the name of a better vision, and yet makes it seems almost no public difference. That is a scandal to God. We're meant to be light and salt. How does that show up? It shows up as a consequence of being people whose lives are, are being other-centered as a consequence of being a people who follow an other-centered God, a God who loves our enemies. In a book that I wrote called The Dangerous Act of, of Loving Our Neighbor, I tell at the beginning this story about this woman uh, named Doris who was 85 years old. And uh, at the time that this story happened, eight, Doris was coming to church uh, one Sunday morning and unbeknownst to us had an event happen outside our, our uh, church building. And, and, uh, and we got word of this in the morning that something had happened to Doris that had been really bad. Uh, and so I was anxious to go and see her immediately after worship that day. She had always been much more my pastor than I feel like I'd probably ever been her pastor. But I thought at least this was my shot at maybe being Doris's pastor. So, uh, so I showed up at the door and she clearly was upset and distressed, but invited me to, uh, to come into her little apartment. We sat down and I said, well, what's up to her? She said, well, you know, I would have had the muffins there, but I got kidnapped. <laughs> So the story began to unfold from there. She said, I was just getting into the car. I was trying to reach back in and get those muffins, you know, those, those nut muffins that I make. Well, I was just going to bring those to our Sunday school class this morning, and I was just reaching back in when I, this man hit me in the back, and then he pushed me back in the car and shoved me across the console of the car and sat down in the driver's seat and grabbed my keys and, and took off. And I said, of course, she said, the first thing I did was to ask him his name. And I thought to myself, oh, Right, note to self, <laughs> when kidnapped, by all means, begin by asking your kidnapper's name. That would be the first thing. So, so who are you, Jesse, he said. Well, Jesse, what's happening? Well, I've kidnapped you, of course, because I need uh, more money, and you're going to be my means of getting more money. They start driving toward the bank. 
she explains that the scheme is that she's going to give him her bank card and her code and that he's going to take some money out of her account. Well, why do you need this money? Who are you? What's the, what is all this about? Well, I'm a drug addict. I just need more money. Well, it's a terrible thing to be a drug addict, he said. <laughs> she goes, yeah, I, I, I know that it's a terrible thing, he said, to be a drug addict, but I am a drug addict, so we're going to make our first stop. So we make our first stop, and, and so he got out. I was just I was so shaken up, I didn't know what to do. And he jumped back in the car, and we took off. I didn't know where we were going to go that time, but we went to another bank. And along the way, I said, so, so how long have you been a drug addict? Oh, for years. She said, well, you know, what you need is that you really need Jesus, and, and you and just really need a good drug rehab program. And he said, well, I don't really know very much about Jesus, although I know that people talk to me about Jesus from time to time. And all I know is about all the drug programs I've been in have just never worked. Next stop, ka-ching, ka-ching. Next withdrawal from the bank. Back in the car. They make one more stop, and then he's about to leave her. And he, she says, wait, there's just one more thing I have to tell you. This is really terrible. You need Jesus, and you need a good drug rehab program. He said, right, I got that, thanks. She said, no, but I'm going to seriously pray that you get caught because you shouldn't be doing these things to people. Have you done this to other people, she said. <laughs> and secondly, she said, I want to be sure that you get caught because I want to be sure that you get a good drug rehab program, and I want to sit and tell the judge that he's got to give you a better program. She says, I started to get out of the car, but I couldn't. I said that to Jesse. Jesse came around, and he got me out of the, uh, out of the car seat, and he escorted me around to the driver's seat, and he helped me into the driver's seat, and he <laughs> put the seat belt across me, and then he reached in and gave me a kiss on the cheek. And she said, I just sat there. I said, Doris, this is terrible. This has happened to you. She said, well, of course it's terrible. It's happened to me, but why shouldn't it happen to me? It probably happens to lots of people. I think the statistics are thousands of people. <laughs> Right, Doris, I'm thinking, that's right. That's right, it's really not that big a deal. It's just, you're just one among thousands who have yet again today been mugged and robbed and kidnapped. Right, I understand that. Maybe you could close us in prayer about your trauma because I just find it a little overwhelming. So I'll just be quiet, Doris, and you pray for your traumatic self in the middle of this moment, and then, and then I'll just get out of your hair because clearly you've got this under control. Now, the amazing thing about that moment with Doris was this amazing sense that she has shown me through so many seasons of her life that her worship had permeated everything about how she lived. And her capacity to see had been changed by all of those ordinary acts. And she had always stepped toward vulnerability, not away from it. And she'd always stepped toward the other and not avoiding them. And in the midst of all that, her life had been redefined. And a crisis like this arises, and at 85, what she was interested in was Jesse. So I was no, not surprised when one day I get a call from Doris saying, guess what, they called me in for a lineup. And sure enough, we went together. And there, there, oh, that's Jesse right there, the second from the left. Yeah, that's him, oh, right there. And eventually we go to the court this given day, and she eventually gets into the witness box, and she goes, hey, Jesse, it's me, Doris. Remember, we had that time in the car together. <laughs> Well, it's true, Judge. Everything that he's being accused of, he did all those things. Yeah, yes, 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 he did. All, all that was wrong. Now, Judge, the thing is, he needs to be found guilty because he shouldn't do this, really. I've told him that. He shouldn't do this. <laughs> but I also want to say, he needs a really good drug rehab program. He needs Jesus. I've told you that as more, Jesse. We could talk about that more. But then also the thing I want to say to the judge is, give him a good drug rehab program. And then having gotten a good drug rehab program, she followed Jesse in his rehab and in his jail sentence. Why? because she was a person who took Isaiah 58 seriously and lived a life of worship that showed up in the places and the moments that actually mattered. She didn't orchestrate that. This was not her project. She was bringing nut muffins to church. <laughs> she wasn't looking for a chance to love her enemy in that way. But when the enemy showed up, she was ready to love because that's the God that she worshiped. Lord, we are called to do something that's very countercultural to the culture, but also to church culture. We're sometimes just way too interested in nut muffins and in other things that just have their place, but they don't show in the fullness of a world desperate for evidence that there is a God who loves, who heals a God of justice and mercy. Enable our vision of worship to be that big and then our practices of worship to be tangible enough to lead us to live different lives. For then, O oh Lord, our fast will be to your glory. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.